All right, so the next section we're going to talk about is uh, polynomial functions. Now, some things I need you to just be comfortable with around polynomial functions. First of all, polynomial functions are continuous. That means that um, I can take my pencil and I can draw the whole thing without lifting my pencil. So there are no asymptotes to think of. There's no points of discontinuity to think of. Um, nothing like that. The whole thing. And that also tells you that for polynomials, the domain will always be a member of the reals. Okay. They are named by their highest degree uh, and therefore written with terms in order from of descending degree. So we start with the term that has the highest degree and we go one lower, one lower, one lower until we get to the constant term, which is the number at the end that doesn't have a variable attached to it. The end behavior looks at when x approaches infinity. So your answer to this will be you either end up or you end down, okay? Uh, some teachers have taught you maybe a more calculus way of talking about behavior where you say as x approaches positive infinity, y does this, and as x approaches negative infinity, y does this, um, which is awesome. For purposes of your diploma though, we're looking to see whether you end up or down, and we get that from uh, the leading coefficient, okay? Um, the number of turning points will always be one less than the degree of the polynomial. So if I have a degree eight, um, a degree eight will have seven turning points, okay? Now, the only thing I wanna mention there, just so that it doesn't cause any confusion, is um, an inflection point. So if you were to look at this graph here, okay, you would see that there's an inflection point here. So when you go to count the number of turning points, there'd be one here. The inflection point counts as two in turning points, two turning points, sorry. So this would be one, two, three turning points altogether. So this would have to be a degree four polynomial, okay? Um, the leading coefficient is the number in front of the highest uh, degree. And as I was just saying, that tells us the end behavior. So if the leading coefficient is positive, the graph will open up or go up or end up. Uh, if the leading coefficient is negative, the graph will go down or open down, okay? Um, <clears throat> okay, so I already said that the domain will always be a member of the reals. The range, it depends on whether you're odd or even. Um, if you're odd, it will be a member of the reals. But if you're even, it'll either be like, for instance, this one was even, right? Um, so this one would actually end up being y is less than my maximum point, okay? Um, if, or it, you could imagine this goes the other way and it opens up instead, well then that would be y is greater than whatever the minimum point would be, okay? The constant term is the number without the variable. It is the last number when written in order. The constant term is always the y-intercept. And then when we get, <coughs> sorry, when we write in factored form, um, the factors always will relate to the x-intercepts of the graph. Okay, then we also want to talk about multiplicities of zeros. Um, the exponents on each factor refer to that factor's multiplicity of zero, and that tells us how the graph will behave um, at the x-intercept. So if, for instance, this guy here, that's a multiplicity of one, because I'm going straight through. So if that was, say, at negative four, that factor would be x plus four. Over here, I have a point of inflection. Well, that's a multiplicity of three. So if that was at two, that factor would be x minus two cubed, okay? Um, and so then a multiplicity of two, if I just took this guy and just added that for a second, that's now a multiplicity of two. Um, and so let's say, I don't know, let's say that's at seven now, that would be x minus seven squared in factor form. Okay, so a multiplicity of one goes straight through, a multiplicity of two or any even multiplicity will change direction, and then a multiplicity of three or any odd after one um, would be uh, inflection point, okay? Um, the sum of the multiplicities is the minimum degree of the polynomial. So if I looked at this and asked you what the minimum degree of this polynomial now is, it would have to be two plus three plus one. So this would now be at least a degree six. The reason we say at least is because remember this is three, but it could have been three or it could have been five or seven or nine, right? And that just gets higher and higher. Same thing with this guy. This is two, but could have been four, could have been six, okay? All right, so without graphing technology, draw a sketch of the following polynomial function. 
clearly label at least four accurate points on the graph and state the domain and range. Okay, so what sorts of things do I know here? Well, let's just talk it through together. Um, I'll have it written down in a minute, but let's just talk. Um, I know I have an x-intercept at negative three, at two, and at negative one. I'm just reading that off my factors, okay? I know that at negative three, or at negative three, I'll go through once because I have multiplicity of uh, one there. At two, I'll change direction because I have a multiplicity of two there. And at negative one, I will have a point of inflection because I have a multiplicity of three there. Um, my leading coefficient is negative. So that tells me this graph is going to end down. I know it's a degree six because I'm adding the multiplicities together. So that's an even degree. So, um, and I'm opening down. So that means both are going to have to end up coming down um, on the left and on the right. Um, and then I would want to get my y-intercept. To get my y-intercept, I plug zero in for x. Just be careful that you have to take into account the squares and the cubes as well. So if I was to plug zero in for x, I'd get negative one half, and then I'd multiply that by three, and then I'd multiply that by four, because that's negative two squared. You see what I did there? And then I'd multiply that by one, because one cubed is one. So three times four times one is 12, times negative a half would be negative six, okay? All right, so let's see if I got everything. The graph will open down we talked about. We have a degree six. We have a y-intercept at zero comma negative six. I have an x-intercept at negative three comma zero. I have an x-intercept at two comma zero, and I have an x-intercept at negative one comma zero, and I spoke about my multiplicities there. Um, when you are speaking about an x-intercept, this is a point just to make. Uh, the word intercept refers to coordinate pairs. So please take note, because I said y-intercept and x-intercept there, I wrote it as coordinate pairs. You can't say I have an x-intercept at negative six. You would have to, or I don't have an x-intercept at negative six. Let me rephrase. Uh, you can't say I have a y-intercept at negative six. You would say I have a y-intercept at bracket zero comma negative six. Okay, so again, you just have to be really careful in how you're communicating that. Okay, so now we're gonna try and draw this. Um, so I just stated everything that I have there. I asked you for four points, um, and I actually gave you four points in all that information, right? So those are the four points that we will plot. I know I've got negative three, I know I've got negative one, and I know I have two for my x-intercepts, and then I have negative six for my y. Okay, now, <clears throat> this is an even degree. Um, I'm going down on both ends, which means at this point, when I go to draw it, I'm going to be heading up. So I'm heading up to negative three. I know that I have to go straight through. Then at some point, I'm going to have to change direction and head down to negative one. At negative one, it's a point of inflection. So I'll make sure I draw that little point of inflection. Then I need to come down and hit this at some point, change direction and get up to two. At two, um, it's an x-intercept with a multiplicity of two. So that's a tangent point or a change of direction. Um, so I'll change direction and head back down. So it'll look something like that, okay? Now, when you're drawing a sketch like that, um, you can't tell me with accuracy how high up you go here. Um, you can't tell me how low you go here. Technically, this little hump could have been on the other side and you could have approached negative six going up, okay? But that's none of that's the point. The point is how the y-intercepts and the x-intercepts and the multiplicities all combine together to get that general shape. Okay, if you want to see a computer generated um, graph of this, I'll show you that in one second. Just make sure you do label the points. So I've labeled them with coordinate points as well there. Okay, so the computer generated graph of that would look like this. <clears throat> um, and you can see it looks roughly the same. Okay, the same kind of general shape. I also asked you for the domain and range. Uh, so the domain is going to be negative infinity to infinity. This is the first time that I've written this in interval notation, I think, since we started these conversations. Um, so just so that you know, um, set builder notation and interval notation are fair game on your diploma. They could do it either way, and they'd accept answers in either way. So if this was in set builder notation, I'd go squiggly bracket all the values of x such that x is a member of the reals. Um, in interval notation, you always go from your smallest number to your highest number. So that's the negative infinity to infinity for this guy. If you can be your, your number, you'd use a square bracket. And if you can't be your number, you use a curved bracket. I can't reach infinity. Infinity is not a number. So infinity would always get a curved bracket. The range, you'd have to know what this point is right here. And the only way to know that is to stick it in your graphing calculator and calculate it. Um, and so the range would end up being negative infinity to 17.38, okay? 
Also, just a reminder then, don't abbreviate your work, okay? I know I've talked about this in other examples, but notice that I actually wrote the word domain and range here. Don't use D and R, okay? All right, now explain what would happen if x plus one cubed was replaced with x plus one squared. Compare the original graph, h of x, with this new graph. So this is a great written response question, okay? And I wanna go through, I've taken each section and said what would happen or how they would stay the same. Um, and I'm just gonna walk you through this so you have an, a, an idea how to do a proper written response question, okay? So first thing I talked about was the x-intercepts. Well, if I replace x plus one cubed with x plus one squared, that doesn't change the x-intercepts. So I physically say that. I would say the x-intercepts would stay the same. Both graphs would have x-intercepts at negative three comma zero, two comma zero, negative one comma zero. I want you to note, not only did I say the x-intercepts would stay the same, I also listed what they were, okay? Be as communicative as possible. Now, how the graph behaves at the point negative one, zero, however, would change because the multiplicity has changed. In h of x, there was a multiplicity of three, so there would be a point of inflection. In the new graph, there's a multiplicity of two, and this causes a point of tangency. The graph would change direction at the x-intercept. So now I've mentioned the multiplicities. Now, how does that also affect other aspects of the graph? We'll keep going. The change in multiplicity also causes a change in the overall degree of the polynomial. The function h of k has a degree six, which meant it opened down on both ends. The new function is a degree five. So now, although it still ends down, the function is going up as x approaches negative infinity. So instead of something that might look like that, it's now gonna look like this, right? It's gonna end up and then go down that way is all we're saying there. Okay, um, that's not this function either, by the way, but I'm just trying to make a point. Um, okay, the change in degree also had changes the range. So the h of x had a range of y is less than or equal to 17.38. The new function will have a range of y is a member of the reals. So again, not only am I saying it changes, I'm saying what it was and how it changed, okay? So be as descriptive as possible when you write uh, rich and response questions like this. The end behavior of the polynomial is still the same in both graphs. Both polynomials end down because their leading coefficient is negative. And the y-intercepts will also be the same for both functions. Both functions will have a y-intercept at 0, comma, negative 6. So I took kind of each piece that I would um, kind of decipher in a polynomial graph. And I talked about whether those pieces would change or not change based on changing that multiplicity of 3 to a multiplicity of 2. Okay. Okay, the partial graph of a fourth degree polynomial function of the form p of x equals ax to the four plus bx to the three plus cx squared plus dx plus three is shown. The statement about the values of a and e that are correct. So I would want you to realize that a would be your leading coefficient because this ends down, a would have to be negative. And I'd want you to realize that e is your constant term, which means it's your y-intercept, okay? So because I'm going down, I'm ending down here, a is negative, my y-intercept is above the x-axis, so my y-intercept should be positive. So I'm looking for where a is negative and e is positive, okay? A possible equation for the graph of f of x where a and b are greater than zero, okay? So a and b are greater than zero just means a and b are positive. Now a and b are positive in this equation. So like that means I could put a two here and a three here. Okay, that's what that means. It means I wouldn't be putting here a negative three. Okay. So what I want you to notice in the equations, the b is the one that has the square on it at all times. So that means this guy here, the multiplicity of two would give me the change of direction or the point of tangency. So that's gonna have to be B. Now, if it helps to think about transformational stuff, um, that means this equation has to say X minus B here, if that makes more sense to you because it's on the right side of the Y axis. Um, so that actually is gonna narrow out it being A or B because they say X plus B squared. I know it's gonna have to be either C or D. The other thing I know for sure is that my leading coefficient has to be positive because I'm opening up 
And so that's going to make it be C. Okay. All right. The following are some possible characteristics of the graph of y equals f of x shown below. I have two options for my equation. I have two options for the sine of a. I have two options for the values of b and c. The characteristics that describe the function y equals f of x are, okay, so dealing with the equation first, I would want you decently comfortable to say that it has to be equation one. Um, I need a multiplicity of three and a multiplicity of two. The problem with equation two is there's a x here. That would actually imply that I'm going through the origin because that would be a factor there of zero. Okay, sine of a, sine of a is pretty straightforward too. The graph opens down, so I would need to have a negative a value. So, so far I know that it's gonna be option one and option four. Now, the values of b and c, again, you have to make sure you're reading this very carefully. Uh, based on multiplicity, we are very comfortable to say that that guy is my c because that's where my multiplicity of three lies and this guy would have to be my uh, b because that's where my multiplicity of two lies, okay? Uh, well, C has to be negative and B has to be positive, okay? Because C is on the left and B is on the right. So my full answer will be one, four, and five. In a numeric response question, if you only have three answers, you leave the fourth one blank. Always start in the left and anything you don't use should get left as blank, okay? Okay, the graph of the polynomial function is given below. Write the equation in factored form. The function passes through the point negative four, negative 16. So when you wanna write this in factored form, you figure out your x-intercepts, you figure out the multiplicities that go on those x-intercepts, um, and then you write it in factored form with an a value. Then you get a friendly point. This time the friendly point was given to you in the question. It's negative four, negative 16. We'll plug that in for x and y and we'll solve for a, okay? So I wrote it in factored form with the a value first. So I knew that this was, I just counted, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So negative eight was my x-intercept. That's where the x plus a cubed is coming from. Then I had a negative three as an x-intercept. Um, that one went straight through, so it was a, a multiplicity of one. Okay, now I'm gonna plug in negative 16 for my y value and negative four for my x value so that I can algebraically solve for a. Negative four plus eight is four, four cubed is 64. Negative four plus three is negative one, so I end up with negative 16 equals negative 64a. Divide both sides by negative 64. A is gonna be positive one over four. Now that should make us feel good because this polynomial does open up and I just ended up with an A value that was positive, which I would want if the graph is opening up. Remember though that that's not the answer. Sometimes we get so excited that we solve for A, we think we've answered the question. The question is what is the equation? And so the equation is Y equals one fourth X plus eight cubed times X plus three, okay? All right, the dimensions of a rectangular prism are nine centimeters by 12 centimeters by 17 centimeters. If all three dimensions were increased by the same amount, the new volume of the resulting prism would be 5,236 centimeters cubed. Determine the new dimensions. Okay, so we're gonna come up with an equation. Um, we would assume that you would solve this via graphing calculator. Okay, that's what the curricular outcome for 30-1 is, is that you would solve this using technology. Um, so you gotta come up with the equation. I'm taking nine, 12, and 17, and I'm increasing them by the same amount. So we'll call that amount X. So now my new dimensions are gonna be nine plus X, 12 plus X, and 17 plus X. So my, and then that equals, when I multiply them all together, 5,236. So I'm going to put this in Y1 and this in Y2, and I'm gonna find the intersection point. Uh, that's the graph that you should get with Y1 and Y2. You're going to have to adjust your window settings. Remember that uh, your Y value by default only goes up to 10 and you need to go above 5200 right now. So make sure you kind of take that into account. Um, okay, solve for the intersection point on a Casio, that's F5, F5. On a TI, that's second trace 5, enter, enter, enter. And you're going to get an X value of 5. Now you got to be very, very careful. That's not the question you need to make sure you answer the question. The question said, determine the new dimensions. 
five is just what you're increasing by. So the new dimensions would be 14 by 17 uh, by 22 centimeters. Also, don't forget your units. That's also a big deal, okay? Okay, so now we're gonna shift uh, our thinking a little bit and talk about some division of polynomials. Uh, we need to talk about division of polynomials so that then we can get into more algebraically factoring at the end of this section. Uh, so long division of polynomials is much like long division with numbers. You're always trying to get rid of the term that is to the left of the polynomial. Make sure all the degrees are represented and in descending order. I have seen diploma questions before where they will give you a polynomial that you have to divide and there won't be, say, an x squared term. You have to make sure you have a zero in there as a placeholder when you go through the process of long division or synthetic division. Every degree has to be represented and in order from highest degree to smallest, like highest degree to the constant term. Synthetic division is a quick way of dividing a polynomial by a binomial, as long as the coefficient is one. So like you can divide by x plus three or you can divide by x minus five. You don't wanna use synthetic division if you're dividing by like two x minus one. The coefficient there is not a one, um, then you'd wanna go back to long division, okay? So I'm gonna walk you through both of them. Um, first one, oh, well, okay, here are the steps, first of all, for synthetic division. Now. You may have been taught, some, there's two different ways to do synthetic division. One is by subtracting the columns and one is by adding the columns. I'm doing what historically I think is the easier one for most kids, which is adding the columns. Um, if your teacher taught you a different way and you are really good at that way, then ignore the next couple of seconds here. Uh, do it your way. Don't adopt a different way if you're good at what you do, okay? Um, but if you're not good at what you do, uh, just take a look at how I'm going to do it, okay? So we're going to list the coefficients of p of x in order with all the degrees represented. Um, this is if I'm dividing by x minus a. So place your divisor a to the left. So a would be the, the letter a symbolizes here the value for x that would kind of zero that binomial out. Drop the first number in p of x to the third row, multiply by a, and stick your solution under the second number. Okay, uh, add the second column, continue the pattern. The resulting numbers are the coefficients of your quotient dropping one degree. And the last number is your remainder. Okay, and I'm gonna show you that in a minute. And we're just gonna do a couple more definitions here. The remainder theorem states that if you divide P of X by X minus A, the remainder will be whatever P of A is. So sometimes I don't need to do all the division. Sometimes I just need to know what the remainder is. So if that's the case, Take that a value, plug it into your original polynomial. That's why I'm saying p of a. And then what that will always give you out is your remainder. Um, using the above, the factor theorem really states the same thing. It's just that if p of a ends up being zero, then you figured out a factor, right? Because the definition of a factor is you can divide it evenly and there won't be any remainder. So if the remainder theorem gives us out a zero, then what we actually found was the factor. So we call that the factor theorem. So to divide a polynomial that is larger than degree two, you need to find a factor first, then divide that factor using synthetic division or long division, and then factor the resulting smaller degree polynomial. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna divide the following. Now, the first thing I'm gonna do with you, and I'm gonna do it on the board, is I'm going to do long division, okay? Because I wouldn't feel it appropriate if you didn't have one kick at long division. So. I've got x plus 3 on the outside, and on the inside, I've got x cubed uh, plus 10x squared, sorry, uh, my, plus 12 minus 32, 12x minus 32. So I want to make sure I go 3, 2, 1, nothing. So I have every degree represented, okay? And now what I'm always trying to do is I'm always trying to get rid of what's on the left. So I'm trying to get rid of the x cubed at the moment. So I'm asking myself, what would I put up here so that when I multiply it by x plus 3, I will end up with an x cubed? Well, I know I'm going to have to multiply by x, so I need an x squared up here because I know that x squared times x would give me x cubed. So I stick an x squared up here. Notice that I'm, I'm creating columns here. So I stuck the x squared in the same column as the 10x squared, okay, so that I have everything lined up nice and, nice and neat. 
Okay, now I have to multiply this guy by here. So x squared times x is x cubed, and x squared times 3 is 3x. Now I'm going to subtract x cubed minus x cubed is nothing, which was the point. Uh, be careful with your negatives here. 10x squared minus 3x squared, sorry, is 7x squared. Then I drop the rest of the terms, and now I'm just trying to go with this guy, okay? So now, remember I said you're always trying to get rid of what's on the left, so I'm trying to get rid of the 7x squared. Well, what do I put up here so that when I multiply it by x, I'll get 7x squared? Well, I need a 7x, so that'll be 7x up there. 7x times x is 7x squared. 7x times 3 is 21x, and then I subtract. 7x squared minus 7x squared is nothing. 12x minus 21x would be negative 9x and then minus 32. And then what do I put up here? So that when I multiply it by here, I would get rid of a negative 9x. I would need a negative 9. So now negative 9 times x is negative 9x. And negative 9 times 3 is negative 27. When I go to subtract those then, negative 9x, subtract negative 9x is nothing. And then negative 32, subtract negative 27, that'll be negative 5. So I have a remainder there of negative 5. Okay, so... What we just figured out was this guy divided by this guy will equal x squared plus 7x minus 9 minus 5 over x plus 3, because that never actually got divided by the x plus 3. That's kind of how we handle the remainder in a division statement. Okay, so now what I'd like to do is go through the same question, and we're going to compare our answer, but this time we're going to do synthetic division. Okay, so I set myself up for synthetic division. Your teacher may have told you to do a box. Your teacher may have done a couple of different ways on how those lines look. It's not a big deal. Don't stress about that. What you need to see is that there's three different lines of work, okay? The first one is the question line. The second one is your working line. And the third one is your answer line. So I put all the coefficients in the question line. I make sure I'm in this right order, highest degree to lowest degree. I make sure every degree is represented. On the outside, I'm going to put the value for x that would zero out um, the thing I'm dividing by. Okay, so that's why the negative 3 is there. Okay, now I'm going to drop the 1. 1 times negative 3 is negative 3, so I stick that in the working guy and I add them together. Okay, then 7 times negative 3 is negative 21. Add them together, I get negative 9. Negative 9 times negative 3 is 27. Add them together and I get negative 5. Okay, so I got the same thing. This represents my answer, but I've dropped a degree, right? Because I just took a degree three polynomial and divided by a degree one polynomial. So that should leave me with a degree two polynomial. So this would represent x squared plus seven x minus nine with a remainder of negative five. Okay, awesome. Okay, determine the remainder when f of x equals 4x to the 4 minus 3x cubed plus 7x squared minus 8x plus 5 is divided by x plus 5. Now, I don't want the whole thing, so I don't need to go through long division. I don't need to go through synthetic division. I just need to use the remainder theorem, okay? So the remainder theorem states if I plug in negative 5, um, I would get out the remainder. So I'm going to do that. I plug in negative 5, and I do the math, and I end up getting 3,095. Okay, you can also use the store feature on your graphing calculator to do this. And I would like to take a second just to show that to you. So just let me switch to a graphing calculator for a sec. Um, and what you would do is essentially your, your store button is right here on a Casio. It's that arrow. Um, on a TI, if you have a TI, it's right around down here and it will say STO. Uh, and you'll also see that arrow. Okay, so what we do is we say, type in the value, so negative 5, and we want to say store as x, okay, and then just hit enter, and it'll give you back negative 5. Now, every time you press x, uh, your calculator is going to put that in as negative 5, so it's just a little quicker because then you don't have to worry about the brackets, okay? So the original question was 4x to the 4 uh, minus 3x squared, whoops, sorry, I got to get out of there, uh, minus 3x to the 3, I should have said, 3x to the 3, uh, plus 7x squared, uh, 
uh, and sorry, I just covering the question 8x plus 5. So minus 8x plus 5. Okay, and then hit enter and you get the 3095. Okay, this, while I have this here, I just want to show you, this is a nice feature because then you can also, if you were trying to find a zero, you can also just go up if you have a calculator that will do this for you and change that to one and it'll update itself, okay? Um, now, if you don't have a calculator that will do that for you, um, on a new TI, you can just um, type in your new store feature and then just go up and highlight. So if you go up and highlight, here, you could press enter twice and it will jump down. It'll copy that down for you, okay? All right, I'm gonna switch back to the PowerPoint now. Okay, and we'll continue on. So given f of x equals three x cubed plus eight x squared minus x minus 10, determine which of the following binomials is a factor. Now, the easiest way to do this on a multiple choice question is really just put in your graphing calculator and figure out what the factors are, okay? Um, the other way you could do that is you could plug in negative one, you could plug in negative five over three, you could plug in neg 10, and you could plug in neg two over three for x and see which one gives you out of zero, right? If it's a factor, you could use the remainder theorem and it would give you out of zero. You should get three x plus five there, okay? All right. When 2x to the 5 plus x cubed plus kx squared plus 3 is divided by x plus 2, the remainder is negative 37. Determine the value of k. Well, I'm just using the remainder theorem here. I'm going to plug in negative 2 for x, and I know that if I plug in negative 2 for x, I get out the remainder. Well, <clears throat> the remainder is negative 37, so I just say that that equals negative 37. Okay? Okay, um, so now I'm just gonna do the math. Uh, I'll add all those terms on the right together and then I'll add 69 to both sides. And that ends up with K equals eight. Okay, so the value of K is eight. Okay, completely factor P of X equals X cubed plus five X squared minus eight X minus 48. Well, on a diploma, if there's a written response, you could graph this right away. You could get yourself a picture. You could figure out what the factors are. And you know right away that that's going to turn into x plus 4 squared times x minus 3. Okay, you're just doing that straight off the picture. Great. You're not going to get anything for that because this was a written response question and they want you to determine it. They want you to arrive at that answer. So we, what we have to talk about is how do we arrive at that answer? So... I'm gonna pick on the X minus three as the factor. And the first thing I'm gonna do is say, okay, P of three equals zero. And that's how I know that X minus three is a factor, okay? P of three equals zero, therefore X minus three is a factor. If I know that X minus three is a factor, I can then go into synthetic division, divide it all out, okay? So you do it, make sure you're getting the same answers, but that now leaves me with X minus three times what's left over, and what's left over is x squared plus 8x plus 16, okay? Well, now I go and say, okay, can I factor this piece? Do I know two numbers that multiply together to give me 16 and add together to give me 8? I do, that's x plus 4 times x plus 4, and then I see that I have two x plus 4s, and I put them together to show my multiplicity of 2, okay? So I have now arrived, I've determined that answer without just looking like I used my graphing calculator to figure out the answer, okay? All right. Um, if the factored form of 3x cubed minus 2x minus 17x, sorry, 2x squared minus 17x minus 12 is that, uh, then what is ax plus b? Again, from a multiple choice standpoint, you could graph 3x cubed minus 2x squared minus 17x minus 12, and you could find the three different um, uh, x-intercepts. Only one of them is going to be fractional, um, and it's the fractional one that would be this ax plus b, right? So, for instance, if you got, um, I don't know, I'm just going to make it up for a second so that you can see how you do that. Let's just say you got one of your answers as x equals uh, 0 0.33333 repeat, okay? Now, 
you know that as one third, I'm hoping. Even if you didn't, that's okay. Go back to your, um, go back to your calculator portion, like your two plus two equals four calculator portion, and just go X and hit enter. So you get that number and then just switch it to a fraction and it'll tell you one third. Okay, so then if X equals one third, if I wanna get that as um, a factor that involves only integers, I would multiply both sides by three and then I would add or subtract the one. So that would be the factor 3x minus 1, okay? So in this example, one of your x-intercepts is going to be a decimal. You just change it to a fraction, and then you create the factor by getting um, 0 on one side, okay? Now, when you do that, you should end up with it being 3x plus 4, okay? So your x-intercept there would have been negative 4 over 3. So um, that is it for polynomials. Um, so we're going to stop here and I'll see you next time for radicals. Okay.